you're listening to the SAS Says Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Rocha, also known as SAS. I identify as a woman, a wife, and a mother. That should tell you a lot already. And over the last few years, I've learned the value of talk therapy. I have seen how my inner work not only enhances my own well-being, but also my marriage, my parenting, my relationships. And in fact, you wouldn't be hearing this right now if it weren't for the work I've done. My mission is to debunk the misconceptions and stigmas around what therapy is and who it's for. Let's normalize working on our mental health and seeking help when needed. We've all heard of self-care, self-help, and self-love, but do you often wonder how to actually make it all happen? I do. You'll hear strategy-based conversations with professionals, as well as inspiring and validating stories from women who are just like you and me. Think of this podcast as the weekly therapy sessions you didn't know you needed, with a dash of sass, a lot of vulnerability, and me, relentlessly asking, but how? Welcome to the show. Today is the second episode of a four-part solo series dedicated to self-care and to introducing you to who I am, why I'm here, and what I've learned so far from the amazing guests on my show when it comes to self-care. In the episodes to come of this series, you will hear my thoughts on marriage, parenting, ambition, and the intangible. But today, I thought it fitting to start with pregnancy and body. Why? Because they are closely related, obviously. Secondly, because... My mental health journey, I would say, really became like heavy, (laughs) really became uh, a place of focus during and after pregnancy. So I'm going to give you a brief rundown of my pregnancies, but more so from the perspective of the ways in which they played a part in my mental health journey. Um, So... This isn't for the sake of, hey, here's how I gave birth. It's more what was happening during the pregnancies and the deliveries that contributed to my mental health and where it is now. But for the details of kind of just catching you up to speed, I do want to give a quick little recap. So the first pregnancy was vaginal delivery. I had an epidural. My daughter, Lucia, was born. She's four years old. My second pregnancy, vaginal delivery, no epidural. Yeah. Uh, My son, Juan Carlos, and he's about two years old. So now I'm going to break things down a bit. My first pregnancy was pretty easygoing. I wasn't loving it, but I wasn't hating it either. I took a lot of pride in keeping my weight down. And uh, that was very important to me. I was very focused on that. And fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure anymore, I was validated in this endeavor Every time I went to the doctor's office, every nurse, every admin, every doctor would comment on my body and weight. I mean, it's obviously part of the process. They check your weight, but there's always a conversation about it. And granted, they were commenting usually nice things, but I remember feeling pressure. You know, I was mostly feeling the pressure for myself, but getting that sort of pat on the back also felt pressure of, okay, wow, now I really can't gain too much weight because all these people will notice and I won't get that pat on the back anymore. If if you've listened to every show up to this point, you can hear the learnings coming through even as I tell that story, right? Like I never would have thought there was a problem with that before having all these conversations on the show. So anyway, you know, food for thought. So delivery, nothing too noteworthy here other than that it's quite startling that you deliver a baby and the nurse just hands her over to you like you're supposed to know what to do. Uh, The nurse literally was like, okay, so you can feed her now. Like, what? (laughs) I can what now? Can you show me how these things work? Um, I wanted to breastfeed, but I can 100% confidently say that I wanted to breastfeed uh, mostly because I wanted it to help me lose weight. Yes, it was, you know, quote unquote, better for baby, whatever. Um, But I really wanted to do it, and I wanted it to work because I wanted help with weight loss. I really struggled with breastfeeding. I did it for six long, horrible weeks. Yeah, weeks. Until I finally had enough. It wasn't for me. My daughter was also up all night, every night for the first, um, I don't know, eight weeks of her life. No exaggeration. It was out of control. And she didn't actually begin going to bed at a decent hour and sleeping through the night until she was 
about a year old. In hindsight, I can see that I was experiencing postpartum depression and anxiety. I think it's important to share here a bit of what that depression and anxiety looked like for me because it was truly through hearing other women share the details of their experiences that pushed me to get help and to really understand what was going on for me. So first baby, postpartum, I didn't leave the house like for weeks. (laughs) I had no desire to. It felt way too overwhelming and way too stressful to leave the house with my baby. I hardly got dressed. Um, I mean, it was a lot if I brushed my teeth and brushed my hair. I didn't want to talk or see anyone really. I cried a lot and I was super exhausted. And I remember my baby was crying again for the gazillionth night in a row and begging my husband to switch places with me again and just going, I'm going to throw this baby over the railing. Yeah, it freaked him out. (laughs) But the thing is, I had to be reminded of that incident. I didn't even remember it happening initially. Now, I never thought for a second uh, that I really would throw her over the railing. It's a pretty extreme thought, um, one that I can't imagine having now, especially with the level of desperation that was expressed that night. But I did then, and I know what that is now. I was also having those nerve-wracking thoughts of, what in the actual did I just do? Like, is this my life now? (laughs) Prior to becoming a mom, I did not have a clear picture of what motherhood would look like and feel like, especially in those early months. And I struggled with a great sense of lost identity. I'll come back to loss of identity in a bit, but I want to deep dive the second pregnancy a bit. Second time around, I started out really strong, determined to beat my weight goal gain by gaining less than I did the first time. This motivation was initially on fire, but very short-lived. I went from going to the gym every day to barely being able to swim in the pool due to sciatic pain in my right leg. Also, pregnancy with an existing toddler (laughs) needs to come with a warning label or just be entered into the Olympics as an extreme sport. It is no joke. I've (laughs) that exhaustion. It's it's insane. I also, in hindsight, can see where depression creeped in in my third trimester. I remember specifically missing one of my dearest oldest friend's birthday dinner. I couldn't believe I did it, but I also couldn't go. I couldn't get out of bed physically, mentally. So long story short, I gained more weight than I did the first pregnancy. I was so burnt out from the first go around and having a toddler and now experiencing some undiagnosed depression. I felt completely detached from my baby and the whole experience. His birth was wild, though, and that is ultimately what really connected me to him. I had contractions on and off throughout the day, but by about 8, eight o'clock-ish, 8 p.m., they were trackable. By 10-ish, we called the doctor and my parents to come over to stay with my daughter. The doctor said, yeah, if you want, head into the hospital. You can, but, you know, no, no need to rush. Yeah, another long story short here is... Um, that my doctor didn't make it to the, make it in time to the hospital. Yeah, I went so fast. Um, there are a few memorable moments. One, I was facing the wall of the hospital lobby waiting for my husband to park the car. I had one hand against the wall and the other on my belly. And I was just swaying back and forth, breathing, (laughs) trying to breathe. A nurse pops by and asks if she can get me into a wheelchair, but I insist I am fine. Like, literally minutes later, I am up on the maternity floor and I can barely stand and the same nurse shows up with a wheelchair like, hey, I know you. You want to take this seat now? (laughs) Um, The second moment I can remember vividly is being in the maternity lobby waiting to be checked in and trying to converse with the other women who are actually conversing with each other. Meanwhile, my contractions are so strong, I am white knuckling the chair. Then I'm going into the intake room and I'm completely freaked out that I cannot lock it down with these contractions. When I was in that same intake room with my first pregnancy, I was in pain, but I was managing it. This was next level. I couldn't even help it. I was moaning. I was yelling, screaming. And a doctor comes in and goes, yeah, so I can hear that your contractions are pretty strong. Let's take a look. 
Next thing I hear is, Paige, everyone, she's nine centimeters. We got to go. So in very Grey's Anatomy form, we're signing paperwork as I'm being wheeled into the delivery room. (laughs) And the cool thing that makes me smile and even cry sometimes is thinking of that delivery room filled with all women, nurses and doctors delivering my baby and taking care of us. Yeah. So like I said, my doctor didn't make it in time. um, And so I didn't know anyone in the room. And I've joked that I had my own personal cheerleading squad or that it was like giving birth in a sorority house, like literally nurses everywhere cheering me on. My husband still can't get the image of the two nurses who held my legs and pushed like linebackers. (laughs) It was crazy fast, uh, but a crazy fast world that I was completely coherent for. I had no drugs. There was no time. I could hear, see, and feel everything. Um, I, the nurse actually had to ask me nicely to stop yelling the F word (laughs) and saying that it wasn't doing me anything. It was not helping. (laughs) So, um, but I don't know that I've ever been more proud of myself than, than that day. I was in awe of my own strength and my body. It was so cool. And I think that pride and adrenaline carried me through the first few weeks of postpartum because I'm looking at this little baby and I'm like, we did that, dude. Like, yeah, we're good. Um, But I can see now in hindsight that there was also a lot of anxiety fueling that sort of manic need to do everything and be everywhere. Um, And then only about two to three weeks after my son was born did the COVID-19 lockdown start. So over the course of the lockdown period, let's ballpark that time period that I'm going to be talking about now to about a year. Uh, We did not see family, friends. I mean, we didn't even go see. I didn't even go see my doctor. I had a virtual postpartum follow-up visit. Yeah, insane. Um, But I immediately wanted to lose weight. I was hyper-focused on it. And even though hormonally and all that my body was doing, you know, my body wasn't ready. But adding in that lockdown didn't help. No gym, no outings, no school, no activities. And the only food we were having was food that we were cooking. You guys know the drill. You were there. (laughs) And looking back, I could cry. Oh, my God. It was so intense. And I wanted everything to be so okay, and it just wasn't. Towards the middle of the summer, my son would be around six months old at that point. I really broke down. Things got very dark. I would... I couldn't get out of bed without crying first. I was angry to be getting out of bed. My head felt fuzzy all the time. I had little patience. I was turning to alcohol. I mean, I know we all kind of like were joking, a lot of us on social media, like, hey, we're locked down. What else are we supposed to do besides drink? And the thing was that I wasn't really turning towards alcohol in a way that felt fun and festive a lot of times it was like okay there's nothing else to do and like everything sucks so great and the thing with alcohol and depression is they do not go well together so um anyway I was running myself ragged trying to lose weight stay sane and parent the two little people this is important because there's a turning point I was already talking for about a year by then to my therapist, and it was helping. But I needed to name what was happening to get further help. In August of that summer, it was my soon-to-be sister-in-law's birthday, and we were going to do a Zoom birthday party. Um, my my family, like, we big celebration people. Everyone was looking forward to it, and... I was having a rough night with the kids, and the whole time I'm bathing them, the whole time I'm putting them to bed, I'm going, I'm not going to this birthday party. No way. And if you know me, you know my family, you know that that's, like, ludicrous. Like, there's no way that I'm not going to this Zoom birthday party. But I wasn't going because I couldn't talk. I couldn't be with people. I was depressed. I was burnt out. I was all the things. And after I put the kids down, I was like, you know what? You have a few minutes. If you need to show up late, it's okay. Like, take a shower. Shower is what always helps to reset my mind. And the whole time in the shower, I'm like, you're not going. You're going to have to go down there and you're going to tell your husband, sorry, can't do it. And what ended up happening is I went downstairs and I just I just sat down. I, I looked at them. I looked at them on the Zoom. I looked at him and I was like, all right, you can do it for a little bit. And 
then we had a break. They were going to, you know, the birthday girl was going to call some other people and they were going to call us back. And in that break, I just, I just looked at my husband and I said, you know, I think I have to tell you something. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, no, I think, I think something's going on with me. And he just put his hands on my shoulders and, you know, he's like, I know. I'm like, okay, so can you just say it? You know, and he's like, no, you have to say it. You, it needs to come from you. And I started to cry, obviously. And I just said, I think I have postpartum depression. And he was like, yeah, I think, I think so. <laughs> um, and I know he really did because he asked around. He had a friend whose mom was a counselor and this and that. And, and it was a big um, moment because I can very easily talk about being depressed now. And I can, I can say that, but it's, it was scary. It was really scary to name it. It was really scary to say it out loud. Um, yeah. I, but ultimately, it was worth all of that because I got a psychiatrist. I got on meds. They help. <laughs> it's still a process, of course. And, um, well, pregnancy and all that I've just talked about is all related to my mental health, of course. It's related to my body. So, you heard episode 16 with Dr. Connison on diet culture. This was my first taste of, oh, maybe I need to look at this. And I since have. There are more shows to come where you will hear my progression through my line of questioning, but I will say this. I have come to a place where I can eat food and not give myself a bag of crap about it in my head. I can look at desirable foods and know that they are available to me whenever I want them. So I eat what I want of it. I know that I generally don't value feeding myself. I come last on that totem pole, which results in me either not eating enough or not eating enough sustainable, substantial foods to keep me energized and satiated throughout the day. This is a working progress, but I've done this through the conversations on my show, in my own therapy, by reading Dr. Connison's book, and by reading the book Intuitive Eating, both of which I will link in the show notes. I've also taken advice from Dr. Holly, who is on episode seven of scheduling my self-care, which for me includes workouts. If it's on the calendar in red, I'm likely to do it. <laughs> but to supplement this, I've also taken advice from Jax Anderson, episode nine, in setting an intention for each workout or time of movement as, is this for my mental health or my physical health? It takes the pressure off of every workout or every movement needing to be as intense physical exertion. And now that I've just said all this out loud, it feels like I went from like, hey, um, pregnancy and postpartum depression to like, hey, here's how I move my body. So the point is that they're really tied for me because the weight, the weight aspect, I wouldn't have this weight on me, likely, if I did not get pregnant. I don't know that I would have this weight on me if I wasn't depressed throughout quarantine or I didn't have a newborn and a toddler throughout quarantine. And, you know, I don't know, right? I don't know any of those things. The point is, is that they're happening and they're stemming from a pregnancy. They're connected for me in that way. Um, but what started as this like deep desire and focus to lose weight has really transformed into this journey of Assessing my relationship with food, assessing my relationship with diet culture, with fat phobia, with exercise, with all of it. And I, it's like, uh, I had to take a breath because it's like, it's a lot, it's heavy, and it's really deep rooted. Um, and so they're all kind of interconnected for me because, you know, there's, like, like I said, it's like, am I keeping this weight on because I'm depressed and stressed? Or <laughs> am I gaining this weight because I'm depressed and stressed? Or am I depressed? So I don't want to exercise. Like it's all, it's all connected. So anyway, to recap, I experienced postpartum depression and anxiety, which led to continued therapy, working with a psychiatrist and seeking out guests for this show to further my knowledge and build awareness of postpartum depression and anxiety. The pregnancies are what led me to a place of discomfort and dissatisfaction with my body and my relationship with food. The guests on this show have truly, without a doubt, changed my life forever in that regard. I no longer see diet culture, social, societal norms and pressures, weight, body image, 
or even food the same way. It's a big, big, big work in progress, but the progress is notable. So please let me know if you have any questions about what I've shared here today. You can find me on social media or via email on my website. And while you're there, join the Self-Care with Sass five-day challenge. Visit www.sasssays.com care to learn more and join the fun. I am sharing all of my self-care secrets with you, all that I've learned from other women, and they're really doable, they're really accessible, often free, and meant to be part of your daily life and routine. So thank you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Sass Says is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. This podcast is meant to be educational and not meant to replace professional therapy or professional medical attention. To learn more about today's show and what's new in my world, head over to sasssays.com. Thanks so much. Talk later. Thank you.